It's okay. I'm sorry. Excuse me, please. Oh, I am Very warm welcome uh, to uh, Ms. Nibha Nambudri. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm going to give uh, the class a quick introduction to uh, uh, Ms. Nibha. She is a, a, an, a conservation and sustainability enthusiast and an activist. activist. She has, has um, more than 20 years of hands-on experience in initiating and preserving traditional as well as state-of-the-art practices and technologies for environmental sustainability, wildlife conservation, and animal welfare causes. Um, she has been in, involved in very interesting uh, projects uh, which involve, uh, uh, from one side, uh, the sacred groves. I think um, many of you were exposed to what sacred groves are in your classes during the last uh, year but also on human animal conflict um, she's been involved she's also i i, I know that uh, she doesn't appreciate this very much but at the same time it, this is some this is a factoid that actually uh, has a lot of us in awe of her skill set is that she's actually a, a trained mahout in the sense she knows how to uh, she she can she can relate to elephants in probably the closest possible way that a human actually interacts with an elephant and uh, this is something that uh, we're all super impressed and wowed about. Uh, and uh, again, she's very accomplished. And uh, and the most important thing, I think that the thing that really matches uh, with what uh, we do and what uh, what overlaps with her is her passion uh, for sustainable uh, development and keeping in, in mind a very holistic approach uh, to these things. And of course, with a very strong love for the environment and animals. And I think that is a passion that uh, we all of us here share with her. And so a very warm welcome uh, to um, Ms. Nipa. And we look forward to hearing your talk today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Dr. Bhavani, um, for such a wonderful introduction. Uh, I hope I can be half of the things that uh, you've been explaining about me. Uh, so um, I'm very happy to be interacting with all of you. And I would also like to thank uh, Sharanya Sridham for being the reason for this interaction, um, for bringing us all together. Thank you, Sharanya. Uh, so, um, I must tell you, I am not very good with technology Would and like uh, just trying to connect my... Would you, uh, should I give you the host rights to make a presentation or do you not have a yes, presentation? Yes, I, I have a few slides actually. Um, yeah. she, she has, okay, she has okay, yeah, she's, she's able to share. Uh, okay. Can you see them? I hope you can. We can see them. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, we are going to talk about the proverbial elephant in the world's um, living room. And this talk itself was uh, when uh, I was asked to uh, suggest a topic. I the first thing that came to my mind was the elephant in the room. And we are now going to discuss about the elephant in the world's living room, because human elephant conflict is, a, is an ongoing issue that is happening in different parts of the world. 
but uh, today I will be talking mostly about uh, human elephant conflict in terms of the um, uh, Asiatic elephant uh, in in areas where the Asiatic elephant is um, present more, and particularly in the context of India. And my experience has been uh, mostly with working uh, with elephants in the south of India. Uh, conflict, human elephant conflict is a major problem in, in the southern states or the southern regions of India. Uh, so this is the Asiatic elephant, as we all know, the largest uh, uh, living mammal on earth, um, very special and also revered um, in many of the cultures. Um, it is revered as uh, Ganesha and uh, especially in the Indian context, uh, in the Hindu, according to Hindu mythology, elephants have been uh, associated with Lord Ganesha. Uh, so I have been very much blessed to be associated with elephants um, and to be able to work very closely with them and to understand them and to experience them actually. Understanding is a very um, limited way of explaining or trying to describe that experience. So um, uh, when I started out my career in wildlife uh, several decades ago, uh, there was this ongoing discussion in the wildlife community about the future of large mammals and particularly those of um, large herbivores like elephants, the rhino, and also the large cats, the lion and tiger, uh, because they were constantly getting into conflict and conservation was becoming very expensive, very challenging. And in those days, funding was not easy to come by. Uh, wildlife conservation was just gaining ground um, within India as well as internationally. So um, there was almost like a squabble between people working in the wildlife community, people who were pursuing interests in different species. Uh, there were people who were working with the, the plants, the, but the botanical aspects of wildlife. There were people who were working with lesser known species or smaller vertebrates and smaller mammals, birds, reptiles, and vertebrates, aquatic uh, flora and fauna, the marine fauna. So all these different interest groups were uh, there at that time. And then uh, there was always um, a feeling that the more appealing larger mammals like elephants and uh, the cats took away most of the funding resources and people were more interested in supporting such projects than the smaller ones. So I was right in the middle of this debate. And by some serendipitous um, event, turn of events, I ended up with a project that had, that had me working closely with elephants. And I had then decided that I was going to continue working with elephants for many reasons. One was that I had realized there was no point in playing such uh, or um, going by such prejudices or it, because I believe that all species were equally important. They had their own uh, ecological space, their own ecological function. Uh, um, and there was no need for any such biases um, or, to e or to even think about such biases existing. And uh, the thing was, the other advantage that I saw was um, you needed at that time, you needed more ambassadors for wildlife conservation and elephant uh, was a was an the elephants were the best ambassadors you could find because of their uh, universal appeal. Um, so I continued to work with elephants um, because I also found that when you have a project uh, which supports elephant conservation, by that you're also, it's like an umbrella project. You know, you're also supporting large habitats which are shared by, shared by other herbivores and smaller species and the rest of the ecosystem. So when you find funding to, to conserve a large elephant habitat or to protect the elephant, you're also automatically supporting other species that are associated with it. So these were my justifications for wanting to uh, continue to work with elephants. So um, so before we get into the, the complexities of human elephant conflict, I wanted to uh, share certain behavioral and uh, certain biological um, characters about the elephant, which have some relevance to the subject that we're, plan that we're discussing. So as we all know, it's the largest herbivore on land. And because of that, it has large needs in terms of food and water. So it's considered that an Asian elephant requires about 250 kilos of green fodder per day and uh, 250 liters of uh, water. 
water, drinking water per day. They also have a very poor vision. They're short-sighted and they have an acute uh, sense of hearing and smell. Uh, that is a strong point, actually. Elephants um, uh, actually um, remember places and people uh, by their sense of smell and a sense of hearing. As we all know, they're very intelligent because one, um, one parameter that uh, defines their intelligence is their ability to use tools and to adapt. And they also display a wide range of emotions, um, very close to human emotions. Uh, they're also very social animals. They live in herds. And uh, not only that, they're also matriarchal. Uh, so um, the female, uh, the matriarch leads the herd. She makes the, the major decisions for the herd. And then uh, the most significant aspect about um, Asian, about elephants in general, uh, and it has a lot of um, uh, significance with this human elephant conflict issue, is that they're migratory. And their uh, home range, as we call it, is very large. So just to give you an example, um, uh, there was, uh, we had, this uh, discussion with a researcher friend of mine several years ago, and he was talking about how he had collared one particular elephant. And um, that elephant was collared uh, down in, in the south of India, and they were monitoring and recording the elephant's movements. And then they, they in a few months later, this elephant was reco recorded uh, somewhere in Nepal. So the, uh, the elephant had traveled the entire stretch of the country within a few months and had gone all the way up to Nepal. So that, and he, he probably, who knows, he probably would have liked to go further if there weren't all these geographical barriers. So that is just to explain to you about the home range, um, the kind of space that they use. And uh, also we must have, uh, all of you must have heard about this recent uh, phenomena that was reported in BBC and all the other international news channels about these herds of elephants that were um, traveling from China. They call the China elephants. Of course, I mean, uh, elephants don't have any such um, administrative boundaries. Uh, but uh, these elephants, we everybody was surprised, fascinated with why that was happening. It was almost treated like a phenomenon. And they have been known to travel 500 kilometers from a habitat that they were using for a very long time. And they continue to move. And people are trying to, researchers are trying to find out why this is happening all of a sudden. There are many explanations to that, but I just share this just to um, make you understand the kind of space elephants require. Uh, so um, this map that I'm sharing now, it is actually uh, an ancient map which uh, uh, describes the, um, the uh, ones, uh, this was how, this was how far, this was the extent of the distribution of the elephant habitat uh, in the world. So you can see in the West, they go as far as up to the Middle East and even a little bit into Central Europe. And on the Eastern side, most of um, the Southeast Asian countries, they were, they were they, their presence was there. So now this was an ancient map. This was several hundred years. Now, this is a mass vision of Asian of elephants in the in the in India in our country in India. So, if you look closely, I don't know how clear this is. Um, there are four distinct populations recorded in the map. There's one in the south, which can which um, consists of elephants in uh, comprising of the three or four. Up, uh, elephants towards the Urissa and the, the um, uh, sorry, the central population, the Chhattisgarh area, uh, a bit of Madhya Pradesh and a bit of Urissa there. So that is the central population. And then you have some in the Northeast uh, and a distinct population in the Northern part of uh, India. So earlier, so in, in the, if you were to look at the map and, uh, and uh, kind of uh, imagine a, a scenario in your head, these were all continuous land masses that were connected and there was access. They were all forest patches and elephants could travel through them undisturbed. They could travel for as long, for as much, as far as they could until and unless there was a ge geological barrier that, that they, they couldn't cross. So 
But over, over time, of course, our landscape has changed, our land use has changed. These uh, forest patches don't exist anymore. And the movement hence for elephants has been restricted and they've been forced to live into uh, uh, geographically. Now this map is a recent um, by the uh, Forest Survey of India. It's an authentic government uh, map. Uh, this was done in 2019 and this is the latest, I believe. This shows the forest cover, the extent of forest, the green parts that you see, that is the that is the real forest area that is available. Uh, and it's, it says it's tw it constitutes about 20 to 21 per total uh, land mass of India. So 20% of India's land mass is forest. That is what the department says. But again, uh, there, uh, the, the, the question remains of how healthy these forests are. Of course, green doesn't mean it's a good forest area. Anyway, so... Uh, as you can see how fragmented it has become their uh, their uh, habitat once something which used to exist throughout the landmass is now all scattered and they can only as you know elephants can only move through the green areas at, at uh, will the rest of the areas where the minute they step out of the green area they are encroaching into human space and then conflict begins so um, there's also another interesting bit of statistics that um, which is that according to the last census which we had um, in which was done in 2017 by the government of india it says that there are approximately 30000 elephants in the wild now in india uh, because in our country the census happens every 5 years so the last census uh, explains this is the last uh, census statistics so how do you connect all these all this data together what does it mean in terms of um, the survival of elephants in the wild it's it's very bleak. For one is there's only 20% of forest available and you're all, all the elephants are separated into little groups. That means you cannot mix, populations cannot mix and mixing of populations is very important for a healthy, viable um, population of elephants to survive because there has to be a genetic mixing of gene pools. So that is, that access is restricted and denied. And, uh, um, and again, considering all the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, Sub, the subsequent threats that are associated with encroachment, with increasing population, the pressure on these existing forest systems are increasing. So it is only for, for a, any sensible person can, can imagine how bleak the future is for the survival of um, elephants in the wild. So what exactly is conflict? I mean, uh, obviously, Obviously, the word um, in the English language is quite obvious, but in terms of humans and elephants getting into conflict, what are the reasons? And uh, uh, obviously, I mean, some of the some of the most of the reasons are pretty obvious. One is, like I explained earlier, the fragmentation of the migratory routes and um, restricted movement forces them to look uh, to come out of the the their parks and their reserve forests. And uh, they also have to come out, they're forced to come out of these areas sometimes in search of fodder or, uh, a, a, or in, in search of water for access to food and water resources. And um, sometimes encounters happen not just when elephants go out into uh, human habitations, it also happens the other way around. Because people living in fringe areas have a very close connect with the forest uh, and the forest systems. So oftentimes people uh, get into forests for cattle grazing or when they go for firewood collection or whenever they have some type of collection of natural resource when they depend on the forest for some resource and, or, or just simply because they're commuting because they live probably in the fringe of the forest and they would have to cross a certain forest piece of, piece of forest land to get somewhere else. So during such um, episodes, sometimes you encounter an elephant and there is a conflict and often it turns it works out very badly for the humans because it may end in the death of a person or in severe injuries um, and sometimes what happens is that uh, another reason major reason for for conflict um, to 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 intensify is when there is a, a a fragmented piece of forest and there is a high density of elephants in that area 
obviously it leads to competition for resources for food and water so what happens there's a spillover you know like they spill out then a few num few elephants decide to come out the park and look for food and water somewhere else and they invariably end up in um, in a farmland which is very close to the forest or the the the, the park the national park uh, and they probably will uh, would have to come close to human settlements in search of water if there is a pond or a water body they might have to step out of the park or the forest area and uh, in search of this water resource so very often uh, such um, such movements or such uh, transgressions lead to very intense conflict so we uh, it ends up in crop raiding and such elephants are called crop raiders they are branded and uh, so what exactly is uh, crop raiding so uh, you find uh, elephants, like I explained, and sometimes they get into human habitations. And uh, most of the time, the kind of crops that are cultivated there, like paddy, corn, sugar cane, there's jackfruit, coconut, all these are favorite elephant foods. It's like uh, coming across a candy store, a kid coming across a candy store. It's like a treat for them, veritable treat. So uh, it's very natural for them to, to move towards such uh, freely available, delicious, you know, something which is palatable, easily digestible. And there's very little competition as well. So it's very natural for them to, to choose such foods, you know, this type of foraging behavior. So in the process, what happens is that elephants are also known to be major wasters in, uh, in the natural systems. Uh, that happens with most herbivores, especially particularly with elephants. You know, they they the, their feeding behavior is such that a large part of the food that they uh, procure for feeding goes a waste. So what happens is that when uh, an entire herd, you can imagine an entire herd, the kind of damage that they can create, especially with adults and unruly you know uh, misbehaving calves and sub adults. What can it's complete yeah. havoc. And from a farmer's yeah, perspective, from a farmer's perspective, this is uh, this is very, it's very, uh, what you call. Uh, people, uh, you can't be surprised that the farmers are hostile or disgruntled because may, most of these farmers, many of them, are subsistence farm on uh, loans or microcredits, and um, that is how they manage farming. And agriculture has not been. Uh, faring well as an occupation or an industry for the past few years, more because of the the, the absence of right policies from the on the on the side of the government, and also climate change has affected a lot of harvesting processes has interfered and uh, affected uh, agricultural uh, processes. So. You can only imagine the kind of hostility that exists towards elephants, and um, and a herd of elephants. You know, they this is a, a year's work for a farmer. Uh, he spends his, an entire year or a part of the season uh, trying to um, to farm and uh, you know trying to um, make these crops. And it just takes a herd of elephants one night to completely destroy that paddy field and that years of uh, one one year of um, uh, hard labor. So you can only imagine the intensity of uh, the emotional intensity that goes behind such conflict situations from the, on the human side. So why do elephants raid crops? That has been, um, I mean, I have, we can imagine why, because uh, we've discussed quite a bit of reasons, but there are also certain other reasons. One is that uh, most of these farmlands that exist were early actually part of the reserve forest. There's been, we all know there's a lot of encroachment happening. It's still continuing to happen in many of these fringe areas. People always, there's always that, um, that it's human nature to be trying to, to try to be uh, aggressive and to conquest more and more land. That is a default human nature for most of us, at, at least. And uh, that results in a conflict because there's more and more encroachment as you encroach more and more into the into the forest land. Elephants are forced to shrink to smaller habitats. And the thing with elephants is that they have a geospatial, um, they inherit a geospatial memory. 
these are memories recorded in, in the brains of these animals, especially the matriarchs, uh, about uh, about certain certain areas which they used to live in before, or through which they used to travel. It was like it's like an in the they inherit a GPS uh, uh, when they're born. So it's just natural, instinctual for them to go to certain places which originally used to be elephant habitats or used to be elephant pathways or corridors. But unfortunately, what happens is that during such movements, they realize that this has been taken over by humans. This restricted and then. Uh, it ends up in conflict. The elephant cannot help uh, going to these places because it's part of their inbuilt genetic system. So um, that is one particular reason which leads to um, this, um, uh, this movement towards these fringe areas and so-called human habitations. And uh, over the years, crop breeding has been studied by biologists, researchers, uh, social activists um, for a very long time. And I'm just trying to share some, trying to lighten the mood because it's all very depressing at, at one point, you know, to look at, to see the, the injustice that is happening. But little things that, you know, might um, help us feel a little more connected to nature and uh, to the situation is that some behavioral, interesting behavioral things that came up was that elephants have their, like I pointed out earlier, their behavior, their feeding uh, patterns, their choices for food have changed over the years. Uh, like I was telling earlier, it's difficult to, um, when children get addicted to fast food, it's very difficult to wean them from that. It's the same thing that has been happening with uh, elephants. They've become so uh, used to this kind of food. They love uh, all these tasty, delicious, easily accessible foods that are there right under their noses, their trunks. And uh, uh, and there's very little competition for that. There's plenty of it. It's abundant all over them, all over the place. And so uh, it's natural that they gravitate towards it. But um, they've also realized that they are good sources of micronutrients, which they get whenever elephants feed on on such crops. They they get small doses of these micronutrients. It's like a small package of a micronutrient package. And they've realized that that actually uh, boosts their overall health. So if you look at um, you know, regular crop raiding elephants, usually it's males or sub-adults, you find that they're in really good health condition. Their body condition index, so good. You know, Even a captive elephant probably will not uh, come to that mark. So uh, they have, over the years, developed a choice. Of, uh, they've changed their feeding patterns over the years. And another thing that was noticed by researchers was that uh, the bull elephants, the male elephants, you know, the tuskers, particularly the tuskers, um, were, were found to be more uh, frequent crop raiders. They were actually compulsive crop raiders. It was like a compulsive behavior. So, um, so people were trying to understand how sudden this compulsive behavior uh, uh, has developed. And one argument that some of the scientists put up is that it's part of a reproductive strategy that has evolved over the years. Because we know, we've, we've all learned about Darwin's theory of natural selection during our early school years, our early introduction to biology and evolution. Uh, we must have come across Darwin's theory. And uh, nature always selects the best because it's always a competition, survival of the fittest. So in the case of elephants, um, the, the most aggressive and the large, the greater the size, um, there are several parameters to that. I mean, the tusk size and uh, the general height, a lot of parameters that contribute to um, an elephant uh, becoming desirable in terms of in the, in the, in the reproductive context. Um, such elephants stand, stand a greater chance uh, at reproductive success, meaning um, in a herd, they have more chances of being the Casanova, being nominated as the Casanova of the group. So it's like a, uh, it's like a high risk and high and the high gain kind of a theory. You know, you most mostly it's done with stock, with stock, um, uh, stock broking and such uh, investments. It's a high risk, high gain um, strategy. So now the thing is, the most scientists think that we're applying the same strategy uh, in terms of um, crop raining. So um, the elephants have realized that uh, it's much more easier to uh, find food, to forage food in fringe areas. 
though it's full of risks because it, it's easier food. You don't have to go around because most of the time, another reason for elephants migrating is that uh, they they are, um, as you know, their requirements as herbivores are large. And when a large group of uh, elephants uh, is feeding in a particular area, they can deplete that area very easily. And then uh, there's also when population, there's an increase in population, surge of uh, increase in numbers, they, they, naturally there is a competition for resources. So that is why they migrate to other places in search of fodder. So that is the major reason for why they migrate so, so much. Uh, because this particular piece of land needs some time to recover and come back and, and uh, become lush again. So this is a system which nature has created to, to sustain landscapes and to sustain the needs of elephants. So uh, elephants realized in the new context when there's limited movement and there's more um, competition for resources, they realized this is a very easier way to sustain yourself. And you can, uh, so though the risk, so now you may wonder, you may ask, so what is the high stakes for the elephant? I, I can tell you the life of a, I used to think the elephant was at an advantage being uh, the largest mammal on earth and uh, being very powerful um, uh, with unrestricted movement. It has a lot of advantage over humans, but it, that is not the case. The life of a cooperating elephant is, is, is very stressful um, because uh, what happens is that in order to, uh, to become a crop breeder, successful crop breeder, you have to change your um, regular cycle because normally elephants in the wild, you see they, they feed during their day feeders like any other herbivores. They, they start feeding in the morning and by dusk, they kind of wind up and then rest. But when it comes to crop breeder, you can't do that. You can't feed during the day. So you have to wait till the entire village goes to sleep. Uh, you have to wait till the dogs also go to sleep. And um, that is only when you can start feeding. So that's mostly at night after past midnight. And most of the crop trading incidents happen uh, past midnight, like between 12 and three or wee hours of the morning, like between 12 to three o'clock in the morning. That's when they raid crops. And this has been an adaptation that they have, um, that they have come upon to become successful. Uh, the risk factors are that there's always the possibility of people getting up and the village coming um, uh, uh, and waking up and people chasing you out. But again, they, uh, in the, in the, with the uh, advantage of the darkness, elephant always uh, has one, um, one advantage over the humans. Um, so this is the, and I can also tell you another example experience with working with elephants in the south of India. So this particular stretch of land is in the Palakkad now recently over the years has become, a, has been identified as a human elephant conflict hotspot. This is in the Palakkad Gap, the area between uh, people who are familiar with the landscape of Kerala, uh, the which is the national highway between Palakkad and Coimbatore. On one side you have, um, uh, that is the last edge of the one piece of the Western Ghats there. It's a scrub forest. You can see the, it's actually on the, on the when you go towards Coimbatore from Palakkad, it's on the left side. It's a scrub jungle and it's only rocks there. Uh, one of uh, Amrita Institute College is actually in that area. That particular area is actually not at all an elephant habitat. Elephants would never voluntarily choose to live in such an area because it doesn't provide any cover. It's too dry very limited water resources, movement is restricted. They wouldn't choose to live there. But then the advantage is that there's a lot of farming and farmland around this particular area. And, and a group of elephants have chosen to settle in this particular area. And like any other crop raiders, they would come out at night, feed, um, go on their feeding frenzy, and then come back to the scrub jungle, which is actually a reserve, it's a protected area. They would come back to the scrub jungle in the uh, and then under those whatever little shade was available they would rest there but what happened was that people started um, reacting the the government the forest department of Tamil Nadu uh, was under a lot of pressure from the local people and they had they were forced to chase these elephants what they would do is um, they would 
in the morning when the elephants would hope for some rest, what would happen is these, this entire band of villagers along with the forest department would go out into these crab forests and chase these elephants out. There would be firecrackers, it would be totally in the morning. Um, they would throw firecrackers at the elephants, they would have trumpets and loud clanging drums and people screaming and shouting and they would drive, the, they were elephant drive operations they were called. So what would happen is the, these elephants would be chased from one particular piece of land to another farmland and this would go on. So I can imagine the kind of morning you're being chased around by all these people uh, under all these stressful conditions. You're hungry, you're angry, you, ha you uh, haven't been sleeping well, and, and, um, and your movement is restricted because of the terrain. This is the kind of high risk that is involved for these high uh, sh uh, short term gains. Uh, this is the kind of life a crop raider has. So uh, these are some of the uh, interesting changes that have happened uh, over the few years with uh, crop raiding uh, or with human elephant interactions. So now, uh, um, what exactly are the impacts of this entire situation on both sides in terms of the elephant and in terms of the people as well? There are, in any war, like in any war, there are casualties on both sides. The losses are heavy on both sides. So as you can see, Usually the poor people, the minorities who get affected out of all this, the rich people um, or the rich landowners who, uh, who live in the fringe areas, probably resort owners or rich um, um, industrial farmers, uh, their, their, their damage is negligible in the sense they are able to get out of it. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the marginal farmers, you know, the subsistence farmers, their life is completely destroyed. It's uprooted because their livelihood is at stake. Their life is at stake. And for the elephant also, it's equally, um, um, equally bad. Because um, if you look at some of the statistics um, is, uh, for the last few years in terms of human elephant conflict is that more than around approximately 100 to 300 people lose their lives every year in India uh, during conflict. A lot of them, at least 100 of them, are severely injured. Elephant raiding, crop raiding alone, crop raiding, such elephant drive operations or uh, uh, such situations. Sometimes they get electrocuted, sometimes they're poisoned. Um, during and some of them fall into pits or um, into reservoirs and um, during such elephant chasing operations and um, at least 40 to 50 max 60 elephants die during uh, crop raiding encounters and more than 100 to 200 elephants uh, die due to electrocution electrocution from 40 wiring because we have all these large uh, cable electricity wires that cross over reserve areas or such fringe areas and mo most of the time uh, there are accidents from elephants you know some stray wire uh, falling away and elephants dying due to electrocution so the costs are heavy on both the sides now uh, poaching used to be an issue for some time like it was very severe in the early 80s and uh, uh, early 70s um, but uh, poaching has relatively come down due to very strong legislations and a lot of international cooperation um, uh, among, and a lot of um, activism and awareness campaigns by um, a lot of international or national organizations. Poaching is not an issue, but it was an issue, meaning we had lost almost 60% of our elephant population to uh, elephant poaching, ivory poaching. So having said all that, what is the way forward? How do we go forward? How do we resolve the conflict? So if you were to look at the policies of the Indian government, the policies are um, say that um, we had in, in 1972, I think was the, the first Wildlife Protection Act was, um, was, in, was passed. And uh, it was to protect, um, because the elephant is considered uh, an endangered species, according to the Red Data Book of the IUCN. It's on a high list. It's on a high, it's a very vulnerable category. 
And so the government of India, with the, with the interest of protect, prote, uh, protecting elephants and their habitats, passed the Wildlife Regulation Act, which made it um, punishable to kill or um, injure an elephant for whatever reasons. But despite the act, um, there were problems. Uh, elephant, uh, human elephant conflict issues were increasing throughout the country. The incidences were the more, more reports of conflict and encounters were being reported. Elephant um, corridors and habitats were being threatened. So finally, around 91, 92, the government of India uh, set up a project elephant. This is a this was a scheme supported by the central government, and it was meant to protect the rights of both the humans and the elephants. It had a conservation point of view. It had a conservation purpose to conserve the habitats and uh, the lives of uh, the elephant populations. And it was also trying to uh, protect the rights of the people who lived in the fringe areas who were affected by um, human uh, elephant encounters. Um, so since then, uh, we have been trying to um, work out different um, methods to keep elephants away. This is what we call the EPT or the elephant proof trench. Uh, so trenches are an age old uh, method of uh, trying to keep elephants away, trying to keep them within a particular uh, boundary of a reserve forest. The thing with trenches is that they are, they are very effective as long as they are maintained properly. Also expensive because it's regular maintenance, especially in areas where there's very high rainfall uh, and um, uh, which have uh, a very fragile soil system, it's very important to um, maintain trenches in the right. The thing difference is they cannot jump. Like wolves or like deers or gazelles or antelopes, elephants cannot jump. Uh, um, they cannot jump at all. They can, they can probably climb up or climb down slowly, but they cannot jump across distances. So a trench is very effective in a way, uh, but the thing is, uh, they, they become ineffective when they're not maintained properly. And this is the case with most of the trenches around our national parks and uh, elephant reserves. Uh, and uh, with elect, but they have been, like I was telling you, elephants are very innovative. I had a few pictures of videos of um, elephants, uh, you know, breaking down trenches and climbing across trenches, elephant-proof trenches uh, uh, where the EPTs were not working. The elephants uh, found out a way of eroding the, the bank, the sides of the trenches and crossing. The smaller elephants were helped by the bigger elephants to move across. I was unfortunately not able to load it for the, the today I had some issues with the, with the video. Anyway, and another method that, that is um, popularly being used is the electric fences. So electric fences are also very expensive. And again, they also need a lot of maintenance. Um, and most of the time, why these don't work is that the fences maintained by private people, private estates do are effective in keeping elephants away. Now, another, another interesting thing is that elephants have found their way uh, to work, um, uh, to try to get over electric fences. It took us a long time to realize that electricity, uh, uh, that wood or there were certain elements or certain um, substances were non-conductors of electricity. But it took, I think, a few generations of elephants to, to realize that uh, wood is a non-conductor. And they also realized that their tusk is a non-conductor. Ivory is a non-conductor uh, of electricity. And they've been, uh, uh, they've been, episodes reported where elephants have found to use large wooden trunks and they would just drop them against the fence and break the fence because then the electricity is grounded, it's earthed and they cross over. They cross over the wood and uh, this has been a pattern which has been observed in many of the elephant reserves. Uh, so working with elephants is almost like uh, a game of chess, you have to think of they watch, they, they're very challenging it because you're working with a, not only the largest animal, but also one of the most intelligent animals um, on, on land. So uh, a very sad, but sometimes in, inevitable 
to do with human elephant one is to capture elephants that are that are called problem branded as problem elephants and uh, also in some countries like in africa um, elephants are also culled as a part of the administrative uh, strategy as a as a policy of park management when there is an overpopulation of elephants in a certain area the government decides to cull them fortunately in india we still don't adopt such um, violent uh, policies because i think it's still the land of ahimsa <clears throat> and uh, uh, we would rather capture an elephant alive than uh, cull it so i don't want to keep you on this frame for too long because it's very painful to watch these uh, images so the way forward is coexistence like we all uh, speak about we wish for and in theory we talk about it we debate about the possibilities but um it's something else to try to put it into practice how pra how practical is coexistence for you because when you talk when you are a subsistence farmer who's living at the edge of the forest whose livelihood is at stake whose life is at stake and um, when you how can you expect that person to coexist what what can he do what can he or she do to live with these elephants and still continue to have a a, a, a decent life so uh, considering the, the 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 increasing population and the pressures that it, it puts on our natural resources this is going to be an ongoing battle if uh it's also going to be more intense there are going to be more episodes of human elephant conflict uh, to being reported in uh, various parts of uh, the country so it's 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 become uh, imminent to try and address this problem and uh, some of the things that we can on top of the head which you can just um, um recommend is that a change try to uh, change your land use patterns try to change you can you can suggest yeah. using um uh, non uh, crop you know that you can change the cropping pattern so try cropping things that don't um, those produce which don't attract elephants that is one option you can also introduce the other livelihood uh, measures for people who live in the fringe areas especially the economically marginalized people um, that is another option and um, also there's a there's a need to clearly demarcate the forest and the administrative land this has been an ongoing uh, debate and a topic of uh, uh, heated discussion with uh, wildlife activists and enthusiasts and the government why is it so difficult for you to separate um government land and forest land why is that such a difficult thing why don't you clearly demarcate which is forest land and which is and just make your trenches or whatever physical barrier that you can and have your own resources but if you we did a study of uh, uh, of the elephant trenches in many of the uh, of the national parks and reserves in kerala and realize that most of there is no clear cut demarcation between forest land and uh, administrative land because people keeps encroaching people who live in the fringes it's mostly the uh, the 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 people who have uh, who are settlers we call them uh, the settlers who are constantly in conflict with the natural system they are the people who have this tendency to to uh, be aggressively uh, encroaching upon land there are indigenous people who live in these areas there are tribal communities and their attitudes and their experiences with Uh, elephants and uh, such interactions are very different because um their attitude is a little more tolerant they understand the systems quite well and they also know why all this is happening they don't blame the elephant for what is happening so the thing is uh what can you do in such situations you have this traditional uh you have all these technological possibilities you have resource possibilities because people are offering to buy uh buy back uh corridors and patches of forest significant forest pieces of land there are a lot of interest groups that are supporting such projects um recently in wynad uh, the wildlife trust of india with a lot of funding from other agencies has purchased a very significant part of an elephant corridor it has also relocated the people who lived there into certain other regions and that part of the corridor has been um, restored has been given back into the forest to the elephants and its people 
it is possible to do such things. There are people who are willing to support such projects. So that is a possibility that needs to be explored. And uh, so what can you do? What can you learn from? Because we have a lot of lessons. We have a very strong tradition. We have a very strong value system. We have a lot of uh, wisdom behind us. Uh, how do we use that wisdom? How do we combine um, the, this uh, understanding, this um, empathy, this, uh, um, this need for um, coexistence with the modern technology, the modern research that is available, uh, the funding, the resources that are available. If, if we can combine these things together, I'm sure uh, to some extent we can reduce the intensity of conflict and both the elephant and human beings can uh, try to coexist in peace. So these are just um, very hypothetical musings because uh, it's one thing to, to, to speak about what is possible and what is really happening on ground and what is really possible. But of course, you do need to consider, you do need to uh, uh, try and keep um, exploring the possibilities. So with this, I rest my case. I hope uh, my session was um, useful in some way or the other. And I must tell you, I'm not an expert in the subject. I, I have my experience has been largely working with people because I realized very early in my career that there were, there were a lot of people who were working in the field who were actually directly working with the elephant and working with the habitat. So I realized that there was a gap in the in the in the social side because ultimately that is where uh, everything uh, every decisions are made. That is where uh, change things happen. Policies are made by people, decisions are made by people, actions are determined by people. So I realized my interest and the need of the hour was to work and negotiate with people. So I have been, um, that has been my area of, exp ex of uh, experience. And uh, I'm happy that I could share a little bit of uh, what I knew and experienced with all of you. And I'm hoping for there will be time for some discussions and I'm hoping to also learn uh, some things from you. Thank you so much. Thank you also from our side, Niva Mem. It was indeed uh, very informative and uh, the reactions in the chat box showed that it is uh, also uh, very emotional and um, it was indeed an awareness session for us. So thank you very much in advance for this informative um, session. And you raised some very interesting uh, points towards the end. You mentioned um, how would be the way forward to coexistence and what can we learn and how can we use the traditional wisdom and combine it with modern technology. So maybe we can uh, bring also this aspect into our forums discussion and I request the plenum to extend our session till 1.30 today because it's really very exceptional. And we have, of course, our special guests today and um, I would kindly invite especially uh, Dr. Uh, Tami and uh, Dr. Sid and Dr. Um, excuse me, uh, Ratnakar for their valuable comments along with uh, Dr. Bhavani to maybe open the uh, feedback session or the forum um, debating about this very important and emotional issue. Thank you very much in advance. Maybe uh, Sid, would you like to go first in your comments, and then maybe Tammy and uh, Ratnakarji, and then we can. Yeah, sure. Um, so thank you really very very much for uh, a wonderful presentation, uh, informative, uh, practical about practical parts of life human life, uh, elephant life, it, what happens when uh, one side encroaches on the other, how to resolve conflict. Uh, it's something which uh, in some ways uh, tells us about uh, what happens uh, between human beings as well, looking for resources, encroaching on others' resources, <clears throat> things of that nature. So I found it uh, extremely
really interesting and something which I knew very little about actually. And so I now understand uh, even more what I did. And so for that, you have my thanks. And sense that the work that you're doing is extremely important uh, for the elephant and for the humans who live around the elephant, and that your comprehensive view of the problems that are there that exist are extremely helpful for thinking about how is it that we can um, create better conditions for everybody, elephants included in the everybody. And that's another sense that I had. And I don't know your area, as I said, but the way you talked about matters so it triggered off uh, something which uh, I became aware of uh, a number of years ago, and that's the work of uh, Jane Goodall and with chimps and other uh, great apes. So in a way, I think the work that you do and the views that you have are akin to what it is that Jane Goodall did and continues doing. So in a way, I see you as the, the Jane Goodall of uh, elephants, or maybe people who know the world of elephants better will say that um, you are the uh, person who inspires others in other areas to think comprehensively about uh, animals other animals and human animals and how they can uh, coexist as best as uh, we can. So that's a very general comment, but I'm, uh, I was really excited to hear what it is that you have to say. I was wondering, uh, it's a question, um, the place of elephants in folklore in India and in uh, uh, religion. It plays uh, no small part. That's what I observed when I was in India a number of times. And I was wondering how that aspect uh, influences people in the government, for instance, about making decisions and the farmers. The farmers, of course, have their crops and their subsistence. And if the crops are encroached upon, then they're not going to have. Um, uh, they're not going to have the uh, food that they need for their own survival. And along with that, the place of elephants is uh, important in uh, religion and in culture. So I was wondering how that plays a part in things. And again, thank you uh, immensely for such an interesting and inspiring talk. Dr. I'm so honored that you put me on the same pedestal as Dr. Goodall. I don't think uh, <laughs> that's doing justice to Dr. Goodall because um, she is she's an uh, she's a legend. Because it was people like her who inspired me to get into wildlife and conservation. I grew up uh, uh, listening to stories and watching documentaries about um, her work and other people like her. But anyway, I'm honored. Uh, that I was even closely um, um, addressed um, of, uh, or you thought that I was uh, um, qualified enough to be even um, be compared to her. But uh, thank you so much, Dr. Strauss. And um, your, your, cons your question about how uh, uh, these cultural um, uh, or religious um, influences of um, uh, elephants in our mythology and in religion, whether it's uh, how it's influencing the government as well as the attitudes of the farmers or the people who live uh, in association with elephants. Um, for one thing uh, is that, um, of course, um, India a as a nation is still evolving in terms of um, uh, in terms of what kind of an, of course, we are a secular nation. We are very 
democratic. That is, we have somehow uh, been able to strike a balance between our multiple um, cultural and religious diversities. And uh, our constitution has been designed in such a way that uh, balances all these multiple um, um, religious cultural interests. So uh, when it comes to the context of elephants and wildlife in general, uh, but, uh, with government policies, the decisions are primarily made, uh, uh, technically the, uh, any decision with in connection with wildlife, any policies are decided by special committees, which consists of experts uh, on the particular subject. And there are also government officials from the forest department uh, who, um, who collectively sit together and make these decisions and policies. As far as um, any uh, such, uh, policies in direct connection with the elephant conservation, it is all connected with the habitat conservation. There is no, um, with the exception of ivory poaching, uh, um, th these, uh, in, these activities or policies that, uh, that contribute to the, that threaten the survival of the, the wild elephant population uh, collectively uh, are not directly aimed at um, uh, threatening the wild elephant. It's more because they threaten their habitat. It's more uh, the policies, the wrong policies and the wrong actions are uh, abetting um, habitat degradation. So uh, influencing um, religious influence in terms of uh, protecting national parks and reserves is, uh, I don't think there has been much of an, uh, much of such an influence. Of course, the elephant is a national animal. Uh, people don't outright shoot an elephant. Hunting is not something which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, which is not a popular sport or something which is encouraged within the country or with, uh, because not everybody um, supports such um, activities. And, uh, but as far as, uh, and also, like I mentioned earlier, um, culling an elephant or even euthanizing an elephant is not something which uh, is is an it's not a decision that comes very easily. People would rather capture an elephant alive and keep him in captivity than have to kill an elephant. There, there was once a case, a very interesting case in south of India. There was an elephant which was considered a rogue. He was known to kill more than ten or twelve people, and uh, uh, there were government orders to capture the, to shoot the elephant. So obviously that was not um, acceptable even to the people, though uh, the elephant has been known to be a rogue killer. Um, it was not accept acceptable to the people to kill the elephant, but they would rather, they preferred that the elephant be captured live and be kept in camps. So uh, that was the kind of, uh, that is the kind of, uh, uh, that is the kind of uh, the, the sentiment that uh, supports um, our policy decisions. Now, as far as the government is concerned, um, as far as the farmers, are, it, it really depends their attitudes towards elephants. It really depends on each region. My experience with people working in Kerala, which is a much more progressive state, and the kind of people that live in, that occupy these fringe areas, they are mostly settlers who come from a Christian background. Mostly it's people from the Syrian uh, Catholic Church or the Roman Catholic Church who uh, have been occupying these areas. And they have a more uh, aggressive um, approach towards uh, such elephant issues, especially the younger generation, the, the generation which we call the millennials. Um, they, they display more intolerance uh, under such conditions. Whereas the older generation of farmers who used to live there, though they uh, encouraged hunting, though they were engaged in hunting elephants or, and other animals, there was a relatively more tolerant approach uh, towards conflict. Now, this is the case in Kerala, whereas in the neighboring state of Tamil Nadu, which is not as progressive and still a bit conservative, the, the attitude of farmers is much more tolerant. They, when I, I've, I've met a few farmers who uh, who call who don't even call the elephant as elephant they call them Ganesha they say oh this is Ganesha coming Ganesha has raided our fields at night and there is a certain reverence but there's also this um, this um, helplessness that comes from the situation 
So most of the time, the anger or the hostility that I was talking to you about is, is a redirected, a misdirected uh, kind of anger because people understand basically that it is not the elephant's fault. Uh, they are, elephants are being forced to come into human habitation because of the wrong policies and because of the state of the forests. And the anger is more towards the people or the policies than actually to the elephant. But since uh, uh, this, uh, this is something which they cannot do anything about because uh, the, the local politicians or uh, the, the, the policies of the state as such are pro-development, which um, end up in the, in the devastation and more fragmentation of um, important habitats, the people somehow are forced to direct their anger towards uh, elephant. Uh, in captive, I, uh, though this is not relevant to our subject as of now, but we're talking about the same species. In captivity, we have at least uh, more than 2,000 elephants in captivity in India, in different states. And my state where I come from, in south of uh, India, in Kerala, we have the largest um, population of the elephants in captivity. And here, it's a strange kind of a relationship people have towards elephants. On one side, they're very revered. They're part of temple festivals. They're part of a status symbol. Elephants enjoy a unique social status in Kerala. But on the other hand, in reality, if you look at their life, um, they have such miserable lives. I spent almost 20, 30 years of my career um, advocating elephant rights um, for captive elephants. And, um, I, on, I, and I've tried to understand this uh, this dilemma. On one side, there is this extreme reverence and this extreme, this big fan base for elephants. And on the other, you see they have such horrible lives in captivity. They're tortured, abused. They have wounds, injuries. They starve. Um, they, they are kept in really bad conditions. They are isolated. They don't have a social life. They have no access to um, companion, other elephants. So that it's a horrible life in captivity. So, uh, so this uh, this dichotomy has always been fascinating, and this is this is something probably which you can never find answers to, or you cannot find like a clear cut uh, um, uh, uh, you cannot analyze this or put this uh, as a clear cut observation or whatever. This is how things are. On one side, there is this very theoretical and very uh, abstract worship of the form of Ganesha, but the real Ganesha, the real form of Ganesha is uh, treated in a very poor way. So uh, I hope I have been able to sort of uh, explain uh, or throw some light on your question. So thank you, thank you, uh, ma'am. Uh, I'm calling also out to Dr. Tami, Dr. Uh, Ratnakar, and Dr. Sudesh to share their thoughts uh, towards this very interesting topic. Maybe Dr. Tami, would you like to uh, follow or share your thoughts? Um, I'm just checking if Dr. Tami is still online. And maybe in the meanwhile, Dr. Ratnakar, uh, would you kindly share your thoughts if you have any, and I'm sure you would have. <laughs> yes, uh, Namashwai, am I audible? Yes, you're audible, I, I sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, first of all, my sincere gratitude to uh, Nibha ma'am for the wonderful presentation. I mean, it uh, was not only uh, very articulate in terms of uh, the evidence and the academic rigor, but also was very emotive. Uh, that would be, uh, one could uh, immediately relate uh, to the context and the situation that she was explaining. Uh, I come from the state of Orissa and uh, we are fortunate uh, to be associated with uh, Amrita Vishwavidapitam to implement a project for uh, called uh, Wadi, uh, which is essentially promotion of uh, uh, orchard and uh, agroforestry, essentially. 
uh, in uh, the district of Dhenkanal, which is one of the central districts. Uh, incidentally, Odisha is home to uh, more than 70% of the elephant population in the eastern region and around uh, 7 to 10% of the total population of elephants in India. And uh, particularly, the district of Dhenkanal has uh, about 170 odd elephants. And if you uh, take the uh, undivided uh, Dhenkanal forest division, as we call it, then the number would go up to more than uh, 300. So um, uh, out of the overall number of elephants in Odisha, which is around 1976, so that uh, is a very sizable population. And the area where we have chosen to work, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, Professor Bhavani and uh, uh, Professor Sudhish would agree to that, uh, it is uh, one of the most uh, impacted, I would say worst in terms of the human and animal conflict. So besides elephant wild boars is also another potential problem that we have. Uh, Ma'am, the uh, basic issue that we are facing uh, in terms of, uh, and we have already covered all those grounds uh, in terms of uh, encroachment on the natural corridors that the elephants would be taking and their particular liking for specific food crops. And that has been one of the major reasons. And I also agree to the fact that any such raid has a devastating effect on the uh, tribal uh, families who have uh, who usually cultivate uh, just at a subsistence level. So whatever rice they cultivate, which unfortunately happens to be a favorite amongst the elephants, uh, that is primarily just to see them through the uh, year. So uh, barely anything gets sold. So, um, so if there is an elephant trade, and as you rightly pointed out, more than what they eat, they end up wasting, just like you know those... Uh, greedy persons who take too much during marriage ceremonies and they end up uh, putting all of that into dustbin. So this is, is a problem definitely uh, in the areas that we work with. Uh, but I was just uh, curious in terms of any documented IT case, I mean, in terms of uh, indigenous uh, uh, knowledge or indigenous technologies that uh, are available in terms of what the tribes use. Uh, I have noticed something very interesting in terms of very simple contraption. Uh, coincidentally, this area of Tindol where this project is being implemented, it is uh, densely populated with bamboo. And uh, uh, bamboo also happens to be one of the favorite uh, um, uh, food of choice for the elephants as well. Uh, but uh, the tribals have devised a very simple but very effective contraption um, as compared to, let us say, firecrackers. So it is like they have this huge pole of bamboo, which is split in, uh, uh, in one area, maybe two or three feet uh, uh, vertically. And then they attach a long rope to that so that somebody can pull that from a distance. And, and it is like ringing a bell and it will create a loud clapping sound. And that is kind of a distraction enough uh, for the elephants. And uh, I haven't seen that uh, actually in action, but uh, it uh, seemed, I mean, from what uh, evidence we got from the villagers, it has been quite effective. So uh, that to me is a very uh, uh, sensible way of handling the conflict instead of using crackers or using any intrusive or harmful ways, perhaps uh, some sort of best practices around this. If that can be documented, I believe that could be a good way. And also uh, some sort of an approach uh, from a uh, 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 point of view in uh, choosing the kind of uh, trees that would uh, kind of act as a deterrent for them. Um, there are uh, certain uh, schools of thought uh, here which also look at how uh, we can maybe uh, create kind of a buffer zone between the elephants so that uh, elephant and the communities so that uh, the uh, interactions uh, is uh, minimal and uh, uh, they can coexist uh, uh, within themselves. But uh, unfortunately, um, and also I would, would like to have your thoughts on this, in terms of the whole approach towards governance, I mean, in terms of implementing uh, a solution around uh, uh, how do you address this human animal conflict. Ironically, one of the beet houses, which is very close to the forest area, um, they have dug a big trench around the beet house. So, you know, this, this is, is a, uh, I mean, to my mind, uh, is a very myopic uh, view of how to go about the conservation. So basically, the forest department protected itself. 
and left out the community to fend for themselves to any of these attacks. So, and this typically uh, is uh, something that uh, uh, is a projection of uh, the thought process that goes uh, in our uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, approaches. I mean, good or bad, uh, I, I cannot comment on that, but this is pre pre uh, predominant in terms of our thinking. It's very myopic. So, uh, are there any other best practices that we can take up? Um, in the context of Odisha, uh, probably 30 years ago, we had more than 2,000 elephants. Now we have around 1976, 1980. That is the number that is there. And this number has been on the rise. Between 2012 census and 2017 census. So clearly we are definitely doing something good. But the kind of pressure that is there on their natural corridors for migration, especially within Odisha and with the neighboring districts of Chhattisgarh and uh, Andhra Pradesh to down south uh, and uh, West Bengal, Jharkhand uh, towards the eastern side. So those have been broken off, particularly because of human action and also because of um, the uh, uh, like dams or uh, the Rengali project that has come up. So uh, they have uh, uh, impeded on their natural uh, pathways uh, which they would cross. Uh, and that has also created a lot of conflict. Uh, but we do not see much of uh, literature on that in terms of evidences that are there of how the elephant migration is getting impacted. So uh, is there any thinking and is there any advocacy group that is working towards maybe working uh, closely with the government to address this and uh, create a potential where uh, they can coexist and the numbers can go up? Uh, sadly, uh, elephant, uh, I mean, uh, the state of Odisha uh, was known for its elephants. They were the pride of the state. Uh, in fact, uh, the king of Puri is called Gajapati. Gaja is elephant and Pati is the king of uh, elephants. And this was one of our... But uh, right now, ironically, we are known as the graveyard for elephants. We have lost many of them to electrocution and uh, because of trains running over them, people using electric uh, 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 wires to uh, electrocute them. Uh, more than 100 people lose lives every year because of elephant conflict in our state. So this is a huge challenge, but uh, not much of a discourse uh, in the public in terms of potential uh, uh, conservation approaches. So I would love to know more and uh, just listen in. Uh, I have nothing to contribute uh, to the kind of experience and insights that you have provided but definitely look forward to trying and implement a couple of them in our state. Thank you so much once again, ma'am, for the wonderful presentation. Thank you, Mr. Pani Devi. Uh, it's interesting to meet somebody who's working in the Canal area. I've been trying to read up a little bit about what is happening in Orissa because the last two years, because of our, the pandemic, um, everybody is out of touch with what is happening in field. So, uh, so your questions, your concerns and questions, you know, are pretty much universal and we share the same concerns. Like this is exactly what um, uh, I would also uh, look at uh, to, to see what you can learn from the indigenous systems. Of course, um, uh, each area has its own system. Um, each uh, each area, the residents, especially the, the indigenous tribes who are closer in connection, who live closely within the forest, they've all devised their own systems to, uh, to address or chase away elephants, which are very um, harmless and very non-violent, non-invasive, you know, so, uh, so uh, I mean, there is a whole list of such things available i mean there are such several such technologies but the thing is that the intensity is so high and it's not like before our attitudes even of that of the indigenous people is changing over time we have very little time high pressure uh, expectations on our on our investment so um the time uh, which indigenous systems it is such that you need to you need a certain element of time there you need to be able to actually be on field because I, I, I remember when talking with people uh, in these fringe areas in most of these places, earlier farmers who were living close to fringe areas, there was a system where people used to sit up in machans overnight and uh, there would be night patrolling, like the people from the, the, the whole collective of farmers would share and somebody or the other would be sitting guard overnight 
it over the paddy fields. That system used to be very effective because elephants and wildlife in general was deterred by human presence. So the incidences were less frequent, encroachments were less frequent, and whatever in, um, encounters were not as violent on both sides. Uh, so there was better chances of uh, uh, chasing elephant, of elephants uh, keeping away. But this whole uh, behavioral adaptation that I was telling you about, you know, the, their feeding timings changing, they became animals that were used to feed during the day have become night feeders that is because they picked up on that because um, i think it is with the advent of television and uh, you know the changes uh, with uh, with more access to technology people stopped farmers stopped sitting up at night and uh, there was lesser and lesser human presence in the in the fields in the in the farmlands and that was the reason why elephants were encouraged to to encroach upon farmlands during night so uh, the People themselves said, see, when we used to sit out, um, we never had this problem. But now that every, because nowadays everybody goes back home by, by, the, by the time it's seven, everybody is at home sitting in front of the TV, even the most remote part of uh, India. There is some other access or the other to some technological device. People are, uh, people are not spending more time at night in the paddy fields or in any of the farmlands. So that is one reason uh, why these conflict situations have become so intensified. And you were talking about um, the possibility of using some vegetation. I have um, uh, heard about farmers using live biofences. There are certain species like in Tamil Nadu, there is a plant called agave, which is a part succulent cacti species. And it's like a uh, it's like a succulent, like any succulent plant, like aloe vera. It has these very sharp, uh, thick, you know, leaves which have thorns at the edge of them, and they grow to a height of about one feet. So when you plant uh, uh, these agave plants at the edge of your farmland, elephants cannot cross because they can't. There's a there's a limit to how much they can. Like I was telling you, they cannot jump over trenches. It is not in their biology, so they cannot cross over an agave uh, fence. So agave fencing has been known to be a pretty good bio fence in some places. And the, but the problem is that you cannot, uh, you cannot have agave. It only thrives in dry um, areas. I think in Orissa, it probably is possible. Or you can find some equivalent, some such equivalent species there. The thing is, in, in down south, especially in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, it is more, more of a of a climate, so agaves don't thrive that well here. So that is one possibility. And the governance system, again, uh, like I was telling you, see, uh, the bureaucracy is the most uh, difficult thing to work with. You can work with any department, but the forest department, in my experience, has been the most difficult and obstinate departments of all in our Indian administrative system. You have to be honest, there's no a point in going around and pretending that everything is okay. Because they are very, they they have yet to evolve. I mean, they I think they're the most primitive, one of the most primitive departments we have in our country. It is still that age old, where it still has that hangover from the British colonial system, you know, the whole system of hierarchy, and it's almost like being the army, you know, and the, the communication channels that are there, everything is centralized. And uh, also there is no flexibility. And like I was telling you, see this dire anger on hostility is policies and their of growth. You know, uh, in many uh, departments are all right working with NGO. Some of the closed approach. They don't like working close with NGOs and uh, the sharing of or data or exchange. Uh, conflict is that human elephant is that large part of, large part of the problem or uh, analyzing or addressing the issue uh, has to from people's side from my experience in Kerala we have this very effective LSG local self government governments are very much empowered and much more proactive in their in their role in addressing such issues but from the uh, from the department side it's very stiff and uh, standoffish 
they will follow their old norms and they're not at all flexible. Their attitudes are not uh, great. They're not people friendly. Of course, every state is trying, they are saying that they're trying to be more uh, uh, people friendly, but that is not the case. And, and this problem uh, has been going on for a very long time. This has been pointed, the attitudes of the department officials, the government officials has been pointed out as a major reason contributing factor to the hostility in such fringe areas. Uh, so uh, with governance systems, I don't know, maybe when you have a favorable people's role there, when people have the power to make a decision, when there is a panchayati level, there's a strong people's uh, group there, it may be possible to work out something. But until and unless you have a strong uh, support base from the, or any kind of a flexibility from the forest department, it's very difficult to move forward. And um, coexistence projects that you were asking about, there are there are a lot of experiments going on. There are a few reports, like once uh, there is there are these reports of elephants in Assam, which are uh, you know uh, where the the people uh, tried to um, feed the elephants and where they were kept off, where the, a certain part of the agricultural uh, returns were earmarked for the elephant. Of course, such such initiatives will definitely reduce the intensity. There will be less of hostility because animals respond. Animals can judge. They can also judge hostility, just like you can judge hostility in an elephant. They can also judge your emotions and your uh, uh, what you convey. So if if you are not uh, being non-invasive, if you're not being as aggressive, if you are trying to be uh, a little more accommodating, I think animals understand that. And so the, the intensity of, of conflict can be minimized. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Niva Madam, for this uh, elaborative answer. So if time permits, Niva Madam, I don't know how much time you would have. I would like to also um, uh, read out Dr. Sudesh's comments and would invite and request kindly Dr. Bhavani to close up with her final, with her final words at today's colloquium. Would we have space for one more comment? All right. Yeah, I'm so fine. That, I'm okay. okay, wonderful. So Dr. Sudesh uh, posted, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I question whether lemongrass or chili or any crop that can better elephants question mark and dr sudesh uh, i am handing over to you if you would like to also unmute yourself you are very much thank you madam for uh, this wonderful presentation uh, so uh, we reviewed some literature saying lemongrass uh, you know elephants uh, don't like the smell of lemongrass so it can be planted to deter elephants so would like to know Uh, we are uh, like uh, trying to have uh, other mechanism like trenches or whatever biofence, but it will take some time. So is, is there any preference for seedlings uh, by these elephants? Because uh, of course it is understandable when there are enough fruits, they can come uh, when there are enough fruits, but it will take time. Now uh, we are going to plant in this season. So it will be uh, like a seedling phase for another two years, uh, definitely. So is there any preference for seedling and another question is whether lemongrass uh, uh, whether lemongrass can deter so these two questions thank you madam so uh, so dr sudhish thank you for that question i am assuming you are talking about the project site in um, hanekal in orissa yeah yeah absolutely uh, absolutely yeah so uh, like you said chili is lemongrass the, yes elephants respond to some extent uh, to scent but like I said, the, the problem with, uh, or the challenge with elephants is that they're very uh, aggressive. If there is a, if, if an elephant is set on um, getting to a certain place, it would do it. So um, chilies to some extent, yes, because they are a strong uh, uh, repellents, but it's also 
quite non-violent. It can also hurt the elephant to some extent, especially if it gets into their um, very sensitive. Their skin is very sensitive. I mean, we think they're very thick skin, but there are some parts of their skin which are very sensitive and very uh, vulnerable to rashes or uh, such attacks. And um, so uh, chili pepper sprays are used in the extreme conditions when it's a life in that situation or something like that. Yes, you would have to use it, but otherwise, I would believe that it's a very, uh, it's a bit of a no, 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 no. Actually, and madam, uh, we are not uh, trying to spray it. We are trying to oh, grow oh, it. You mean, you grow mean, it. Yeah, yeah. To raise yeah, we, we, oh, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> we are not to that. Uh, yeah. I, I thought it, you were talking about these no, no, peppers. Absolutely no. Absolutely no. Oh, oh, okay, no. okay, fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I, I, they have not been so far recorded to, uh, to, to show a preference to chili plants as such. Yes, they are very strongly um, uh, sensitive to strong, strong smells, uh, lemongrass. It's a possibility you could try, but I don't know how effective they will be because I don't know much about the population, what kind of a population uh, you're dealing with there. What is the, the intensity? I mean, there are some things that you need to know on ground, on ground about the behavioral patterns of the elephants. What are the number of tuskers there? what is their level of aggression um, it's only based on such things that i can uh, say anything about it uh, as of now and then you were talking about if they had a preference for seedlings um, as uh, i mean they have not been recorded to eat seedlings or mango or uh, cashew seeds but uh, you must have experienced that uh, the elephants when they encroach into uh, a certain area they are very destructive. Just their movement itself is destructive. They walk through a mango grove, and then they may not be planning to eat anything, but just the fact that of their enormous size and their uh, movement is enough to destroy the complete uh, plantation or the area. And they also are known to be quite mischievous. You know, like if there are smaller young adults or sub-adults, they might get into uh, trouble. They might, uh, they're known to pull, yeah. pull away and throw away sapling. That kind of a behavior is also possible. So ideally, I would say uh, if you need to raise saplings to try to do it in a controlled condition, like you have, if it would be better to have a nursery or some kind of a greenhouse system where you can raise the saplings to a certain height and uh, and then put them back into the area. That would be more sensible. But again, you are encouraging by planting mango you are encouraging the elephant to um, to to come uh, to come. You're, you're inviting them actually. Yeah. If you have a mango uh, orchard, because yeah, but... they have a preference okay. for mango. And what about pineapple? Fruit. Better choice than pineapple. Sorry? <laughs> Better choice than pineapple, I think. Yes, pineapple. yes, yeah. Yes. It's it's difficult. See, like uh, in fringe areas. Uh, trying to develop an economy based on agricultural crops is very challenging yeah. because um, the, if you look at the rate of return and your investment, because you will be investing more on uh, anti-elephant uh, or, or preventive measures than on the actual crop. So I think uh, that is why in most cases it is recommended to go for less um, for cash crops, which are not so attractive to elephants or to look for alternate uh, sources of livelihood. Uh, and beehives, uh, beehives like a bee colony. It's like all been tested, tested, but I don't know how effective they will be over long terms. I think a combination of many measures needs to okay. be adopted because what is the thing with elephant behavior is that they they learn to predict patterns. That is their level of intelligence. I think if you have watched this movie um, Jurassic Park by Steven Spielberg. There's a part he talks about the intelligence of velociraptors, how raptors learn to, um, to predict patterns. And then they, they are very good at um, problem solving. So once they realize, uh, once they recognize a pattern, they will find a way of uh, overcoming it. This is something which, uh, which you need to keep in mind when you design certain strategies. And with beekeeping, one thing that I, um, that I uh, understood was in some areas in Kerala where beekeeping was tried it was inviting bears into the um, project site i don't know if you have bear issues in uh, 
in Hanekal area. That becomes another problem <laughs> uh, in okay. the project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you too much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sudesh, for that uh, valuable comment and Niva Ma'am for the answer. I would like to invite now Dr. Vavani to share final, excuse me, final comments to today's session and, and uh, token of gratitude towards uh, Niva Madam. After that, we are closing up with a prayer. Thank you so much, Mandita, and thank you so much, uh, Niva Jifi. Uh, that's what's awesome. I mean, amazing presentation and there's a wonderful question answer the chat has been going off the the thing with comments and questions there are so many questions we will download the chat and we'll send it to you if there's any way you could take time to answer those questions that would be wonderful uh, because i think there are a lot of uh, students here that have even if it's not like I'm sure uh, Sharanya would have told you, there's a lot of people who can, who are like snakes and they like uh, dogs and and cows and and just basically the entire animal kingdom. At one point of time, Amma Chabs was known to be the animal shelter of the place, but one of the main people who's uh, who was looking after animals was not there anymore. But still, there's a pretty substantial group of people that are very fond of animals within the lab. So yes, so there, I will send the questions uh, to you. Uh, Kripa, if you would download the questions and mail it to Nimalam, that would be wonderful. And uh, and I'd like to just mention that your talk was joined by 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 people not just from Amachi Labs and Amrita, but also uh, we had people from joining us from Tel Aviv University. There are about four or five students who are working with Dr. Tammy, who was there in the beginning, I think she had to drop off at some point of time, who were also participating, but also our partners in, in the Dhenkanal area from Orissa, you heard from uh, Ratna Kachi, but also some other colleagues like Satya, who also attended the talk. So you had three institutions listening into your talk. And uh, I think all of us agree unanimously that it was a wonderful talk. And, and I think Sid gave the, the ultimate, uh, uh, compliment and it's kind of how we all feel like you're the Jane Goodall of elephants and it, even if you don't think yourself that way right now we hope that that's that's where we will see you uh, uh, nationally and that's way so we're really happy to to have heard all this and like everybody said it was a it's a mixture of compassion but also so practical it's not extreme on any one side but considering the humans as well as the animals together really looking at the ecosystem as a whole with compassion and not really taking any one side to it. Um, really wonderful talk. Uh, thank you again. Uh, we hope that you will give us another talk on sacred groves uh, as we discussed, and I'm sure that you will find just as much excitement from the entire group to hear your thoughts on that. Yes. And thank you so much. I know we've gone well over our time. We've always done like two hours and you've had us all very captive as an audience. And thank you. So so much the talk. In the cameras and so this guys can all say this is also Dr. Sudish is from uh, who is heading the research of uh, the Department of Agriculture here at Amrita. I didn't introduce him. It was wonderful Thank you. Uh, this interaction. It's been a long time since I uh, connected with elephants. I've been on a sabbatical for a very long time uh, with my elephant work more because it's frustrating when you get into activism, it's not a very simple thing and you have to become a very strong person. You have to have a proper perspective. To towards the natural world. So, uh, it's very frustrating to see what's happening and be part of it directly to face all this directly. So I wanted to take a break to kind of balance myself and uh, to become more stable and to look at things from our more come back and try to go back to some revisit some of the the. Uh, it was a part wonderful. Thank you once again, Dr. Bhavani and
also and to everybody who is part of the program. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. I get very Thank you and goodbye everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm I'm really my apologies for a, for a bit right. But thank you everyone for joining from all different places. Bye everyone. Let us close up with a prayer. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.